Good evening, everybody, and thank you for joining me for this event hosted by Arbury Road, where we'll be discussing the European response to the COVID-19 pandemic. My name is Dermot Kavanagh, Editor-in-Chief of Arbury Road, Europe's newest progressive online magazine, and I am lucky enough to be joined by three very special guests this evening. Our first guest is Filippo Cortale, currently the director of the Italian National Institute for Health, Migration and Poverty, Filippo has spent much of his professional career abroad working with multilateral and bilateral cooperation bodies. He directed the operational unit for infectious diseases and vaccinations of the Lazio Public Health Agency, and he is credited with having several publications in international scientific journals. Hello, Filippo. Thank you for joining us this evening. Hello. Next up, we have Patrick Lagadec, a researcher and one of the world's leading experts in crisis management with a focus on intelligence and leaderships. He develops models on how to address challenges in chaotic contexts, and he holds seminars for students at some of the world's most renowned academic institutions. Patrick prepares high-level decision makers and is the author of numerous books, articles, and studies on crisis management. Hi, Patrick. It's a pleasure to have you here with us tonight. Finally, we are joined by Patrick Trancu, a TEDx speaker who works alongside multinational companies in preparing, managing, and recovering from critical situations. He has managed different types of crises and crisis communications for clients in many industries. Patrick also works with corporate boards of directors to create cultural transformation programs that strengthen corporate resilience and enable clients to formulate appropriate, responsible and ethical responses in crisis situations. Hi, Patrick. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. So, as I've mentioned, tonight's event will open up a conversation on the European response to the COVID-19 crisis and central to this conversation is a new book that is available in Italian. Lo Stato in Crisi, The State in Crisis, was published on March 23rd and was written by 35 experts across multiple disciplines to provide an analysis of phase one from November 2019 to, no to May 2020 of the COVID-19 pandemic in Italy. It was edited by Patrick Trancu and it has one chapter which focuses on the European response and we'll be paying close attention to this particular topic this evening. Before we get going, I would encourage anyone who is watching or listening to send in your questions or comments on Facebook or LinkedIn, and we will try to answer as many of your questions as possible throughout the event. So without further ado, let's get down to it. Patrick Lagadec, the first question is for you. What exactly is a crisis and what makes crises of the 21st century different from those of previous centuries? Good evening. Uh... It is very complex, but I shall use three very basic examples to clarify uh, the challenge. Uh, some decades ago, I asked a schoolboy, 14 years old, to make a drawing clarifying the difference between a usual emergency and something like a big crisis. And he came back 10 minutes after with one drawing uh, where you could sh see a man in a bathtub in his bathroom and uh, shouting, Stuart, my bathtub is leaking. And the second drawing on the second page was uh, the steward responding. And the response was the ship too, sir. And then we saw something like a Titanic. And for the poor man in the bathtub, there was no map to understand, because he was told that the Titanic was absolutely unsinkable. So you don't have a map, you have destroyed your references, you don't have a GPS, you have to invent something. A uh, second example was 9-11, when somebody told a military officer, oh, a air, commercial aircraft has just hit uh, the World Trade Center. And the instant response was, no, it's impossible because the commercial aircraft fly much higher, so it is not a problem. So you understand this poor military officer didn't have any map to understand what was going on. And the third example was uh, during the big storm in Europe in 1999, Christmas, I heard uh, on the radio a, a reporter saying, uh, pay attention, the wind is 180 kilometers per hour uh, in the Paris region. Be prudent, be cautious on the road. And you understand that perhaps he didn't understand anything because 180 kilometers on the road, uh, 
you, you are not going to be prudent on the road. You do, just don't go on the road. So to, to clarify very specifically what is a crisis in the night in the 21st century is you have lost your map. You have lost your GPS. Everything is systemic. Uh, you are not with uncertainty. You are with the unknown and your bedrocks are uh, are in a very bad position and you lose your references and this is the crisis we have to deal with now when that happens and we are, when you are not prepared uh, what happens is instant freezing and you just wait 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 for things and threats going back to your plan going back to your map but you will never go back to your map because it is something else. So you have to invent something and just not to apply the answers you had, the responses you had, the re plans you had. So this is another world. And what we need then is very rapid discoverers to go from what you will knew to something else that you have to invent. So it, it, in a very sh short sentence, this is how I feel with this crisis. And you have to be prepared to be surprised and to be prepared to be creative with others in the unknown. This is the challenge. Perfect, Patrick. I'm going to stick with you for the second question as well, which is, why is it important for citizens to understand and to be aware of crises? I think that in a very complex society, uh, every person, every network in the society will have to, to be in the, in the trend, in the dynamics to respond to the crisis. And to give you again an example, one day I was with school children and you had firemen giving a talk to these children. And the talk was, um, uh, if you have a problem, don't be afraid. We are here. We have the answers. So just call us and it's go okay. And I told the fireman, perhaps you could say something else. You could tell them the story of this little uh, schoolgirl in England, uh, Tilly Smith. She was 10 years old and she was in Banda Aceh during the big tsunami in 2004. And when she saw the, the sea going down and everybody going to see what was impossible to see before, she understood, ah, that was my lesson some weeks ago. This is a tsunami. And she went to see a father. They went to see uh, somebody from the hotel and they had the beach evacuated and she saved 100 person. Uh, during this uh, terrible uh, strike. And what I told the fireman, perhaps you could tell them, perhaps you will have a clear, very important role. You have to involve them in the movement. And this is perhaps, I think, the, the, the key lesson for uh, having citizen on board, because you will need to have the citizen on board. And this is changing very rapidly now. If they don't have the citizen on board, they will not trust anybody and we, they will not uh, be in line with what you would have to say. And perhaps they have the solution. They have the, the, the big answers. And uh, perhaps to give you a final example, uh, during the 9-11 uh, situation, when you had the ferries, uh, it was not planned and the ferries uh, they evacuated between 2,005, uh, 200,000 and 500,000 people from the south of Manhattan. And they saved these people. It was not on, in any plans, but they did that and it worked perfectly. And this was very, very important to have these people on board. And then you have the buses. And again, they were creative in the answers. It was not planned, but they were able to to give something in the global response. And this is what I think is very important to have everybody on board. 
I Perfect. can jump in, uh, Dermot, yeah. just to add a comment to what uh, Patrick uh, was just saying earlier. Uh, I think with this specific pandemic, uh, we have learned uh, that things are being asked of us. Um, we are being asked to stay home. We're being asked to take certain measures. So we are becoming co-managers um, of the crisis. And I think, as Patrick said, uh, in systemic crisis, this is going to happen more and more. We're going to be active parts. All levels of society uh, will be uh, called upon uh, to, to play their role. And this is why it's so important that we create a culture that really starts at the citizen level, if not a culture, at least an awareness uh, of the risks that uh, we face uh, in this systemic crisis and the fact that we will have to uh, participate uh, actively uh, and doing our little bit of the job, to say the least, then as Patrick indicated, if there's some creative minds uh, that can help do a little bit more, then why not uh, leverage them? Uh, but I think long gone are the days of the single man in command. I think we're in a completely different, um, completely different game. Um, and we need to, to A, fully understand it, uh, B, uh, that means being aware of it, and, and B, understanding that uh, we too have responsibilities, which leads me to another point, uh, which is that uh, because responsibilities are thrown upon us, we also need to call for those that govern us, whether it's at the European level or at the country level, to also assume their responsibilities. And I think this is another very important aspect. Absolutely. So let's focus in on COVID-19 now, the current pandemic. Filippo, focusing on the European response, why and how were we so unprepared for this virus? Sorry, Filippo, we can't hear you. You might be muted. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, this is the point. Uh, I mean, uh, we are used to deal with the uh, uh, epidemic. We had uh, several epidemics in the course of the century, the last century. Still, this time, this uh, health emergency became a crisis, affected all the system, the economy and the security of the people. So what uh, uh, went wrong? Uh, in the European Union, we say, because uh, being an area of free circulation, from an epidemiological point of view, we can consider as a unique area because everybody can move and any uh, virus or bacteria which will be introduced in the, in the European Union will travel freely across country. So going to the reason why this thing went so bad, uh, the common tale is that uh, we, were unpre we were unprepared because it struck us uh, as uh, an earthquake or a tsunami. Actually, this is not true because everybody working on infection disease know that uh, we should expect uh, an event similar uh, in the in in these years. I mean, I found in my office one uh, Time magazine. This is from uh, October 2005, and he talked about an uh, a pandemic of avian flu, which was expected 15 years ago. And in the meantime, we had SARS, MERS, and, and another, other uh, Zika, other uh, pandemic event. We should have, uh, keep us aware about this uh, possibility. Still, so the, this is not the point. It's not the imprevisibility of the event. What really was uh, uh, the limit of our system were other. First of all, I think the fragmentation of the health system in Europe. Uh, Europe decided not to rule, not to have common rule on health. It was decided by the founding member. So every country has on, its own health system, its own surveillance system. And uh, this is uh, the, not a good way to answer to a pandemic which uh, uh, in an area of flu circulation. This is something we should work on to improve in the next year. The other important point is more a social aspect. We are growing very confident that the, we will not be affected by infectious disease 
because the problem now are non-communicable disease, diabetes, cancer, and the infections are under control with vaccine and antibiotic. This is not true. Infectious diseases are always there and always uh, ready to strike us uh, unless we keep a strong control. And strong control means also a very uh, effective early warning system uh, to uh, keep them at bay when they start showing themselves. So the surveillance system, like all the system, has been fragmented and we have uh, information which are collected on different criteria of cases uh, within Europe uh, and are transmitted to the CDC, which is the one who collects the data through the, minister, the central minister. So the, it's not timely. So we don't have uh, a timely transmission of data as a decision are not uh, uh, timely implemented. Um, in, in all this uh, picture, we also miss uh, a clear uh, leading uh, agency, technical agency, because WHO is uh, a world agency and uh, uh, provides advice for all 161 countries. Well, we should have needed somebody which can advise Europe, which, as I said, is a unique area for transmission of disease. A CDC still doesn't have this, that important role and function to uh, collect timely data and provide uh, inf uh, and provide advice to the country. So basically, all this uh, uh, to summarize all this uh, aspect, uh, uh, we didn't have a coordinated response because of the fragmentation of the system, and we didn't have a timely response because of this, uh, the way the system is organized. So. This brought us uh, in a situation which uh, looks like we're not, not able to control, even if uh, we are used uh, already to handle uh, epidemic in the past. I think uh, I close here because maybe there is other point we can discuss in future in, uh, later on. That's perfect, Filippo. Thanks. And absolutely, we're going to touch on the on the WHO in just a little bit. First, I'd like to come I, to you. I just want, yeah, Patrick. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, I just want to add one comment to uh, to what Filippo said, which I think is very important, and is one of the uh, subjects that we touch in the book, and it's the whole issue of data, uh, which is crucial. You cannot have an early warning system if you don't have access to data. This, I think, has been a problem across Europe in every single country. Uh, we have uh, data systems that are just not up to the standards that we need. Perfect. Thanks for that, Patrick. And I'm going to stick with you for the next question, Patrick. Can you tell us in a, in a bit more detail what exactly happened at the EU level when the virus struck? Well, I think this is... Uh, uh, it's a little interesting exercise that we can all do together and timelines uh, help us. And I think uh, it, it, uh, what we're going to see now uh, leads nicely uh, into what uh, Filippo just said and the fact that decisions were just not taken uh, in a timely fashion. I'm going to take you through this timeline. We have three slides uh, because I think uh, they explain very clearly uh, what happened. First of all, I would like to draw your attention that the first news, official news of a virus of some unknown origin in China was already circulating at the end of December. Um, and that is the uh, beginning of the story, really. Uh, and then on the uh, 31st of December, China notified the WHO. And then, of course, because it was New Year's Eve and probably people were busy doing other things, the, it took five days for the WHO uh, to uh, formally uh, inform all uh, member states uh, that a new unknown virus uh, was circulating in China. So our story officially really starts, uh, if you want, around uh, just before Christmas. But it takes up to January the 9th for the European Union uh, Health, um, DG Santé, the Health and Food uh, Commission, uh, to launch what we call uh, an alert, 
uh, on the early warning and response system of the European Union. This is a system that goes right into the countries and warns them of a health threat. Uh, you will notice, I mean, anybody with some common sense or sensibility would kind of jump on their seat and start to ask themselves some questions. But it takes eight days for the first teleconference meeting of the European Health Security Committee, and Filippo maybe can speak a little bit more about uh, what that is supposed to do. Um, and at this meeting, there's only less than half of the 27 members present. Um, on January 22nd, the ECDC, which uh, Filippo referred to, um, is, is uh, indicating that there is a, you know, a potential impact from COVID-19 in Europe and uh, that the global spread is, is likely. January 24, we have the first case in France. Uh, January 26, the ECDC states that the probability of importing cases into the EU is moderate. On January 27, we have a request from Italy and, in fact, a few days earlier from France, and I understand from uh, some research we did from Germany as well, uh, to convene the Council of Health Ministers, the EU Council of Health Ministers. Now, um, because bureaucracy is, uh, is a lovely world, uh, I understand that it was the Croatian minister that was heading that council, and there were a number of political issues in Croatia at the time, so it basically took 17 days for Europe to convene a health meeting, uh, a meeting of, of health ministers, which is kind of uh, mind boggling if you think about it. We're on the verge, uh, we're certainly in an epidemic state and we're on the verge of a pandemic. Uh, even if we're not, we should be asking ourselves a number of questions and it takes 17 additional days uh, for that meeting to take place. It will take place on February the 13th. We then have, on January 28, 19 days after the early warning system set off the alarm, 19 days, we have the European Integrated Political Crisis Response Mechanism, which is activated. It's activated at the information level. We share information. 19 days after the first warning, we're at the level of sharing information. And then, Italy, January 31st, declares the state of emergency. Um, and by this date, the health committee has held only four meetings. I mean, we're here facing, you know, a serious global issue uh, or a, a serious health issue for Europe. And this committee, which has all its experts uh, in it from the different countries, has met four times. Meetings that lasted from the records we have, an hour, an hour and a half. And you wonder what kind of decision-making or, or sharing-making uh, process they could, have, they could have undertaken with meetings uh, that counted in the 80s, in the 100s. So unmanageable, honestly speaking. Um, I think what is interesting for our topic of conversation today is also the fact that the European Union has a specific commissioner that is dedicated to crisis management. And again, here, the term is a little bit misleading, probably, because it's more civil protection than crisis management. Uh, but then if you call it crisis management, it should be doing crisis management, which it doesn't really do. But the bottom line is that they have been invited to these meetings, and they only showed up for one of these four meetings that were held. So the people who should have been more sensitive, should have had a greater level of awareness, should have maybe raised their hands and said, hey, guys, you know, we may have a problem here didn't actually participate in the meetings. So let's uh, let's go on to uh, to the next slide. I just, one second, I just want to point out, if you can go back one second, um, to those 54 days at the bottom, between January 9th and March 2nd, which is the time the EU escalates its crisis response mechanism to a full mode, 54 days. It is kind of unbelievable for people who are involved in crisis management, where the key word is anticipation, to anticipate event, to be waiting 54 days to, uh, you know, uh, bring the, the, the level up. So let's go over to the next. I don't want to steal too much time. Um, 
February 1st, the EU activates the Emergency Response Coordination Center and sends 12 million tons of personal protective equipment to China. Okay, I will let you pause there for one second. On the 1st of February, we sent 12 tons following a conversation between uh, the president of the EU and the president of China. We sent 12 tons of PPEs to China. Okay. February 5th, during the meetings of the HC, HSC, um, the countries are asked if they need personal protective equipment. On February the 5th, we're almost one month down the road from the original alert. And on February 5th, we're asking the countries if they need anything. Of course, nobody responds. This is the other thing, because uh, we tend, and certainly we're putting a focus tonight uh, on some of the shortcomings of the European Union, but we also have to remember, first of all, as Filippo said, the European Union does not have a remit for healthcare, number one. Um, and number two, uh, if it doesn't get the information from the, from the member states, then it's very difficult for it to act. Uh, so nobody, nobody answers. So the Commission decides to launch a formal assessment. So it basically sends out uh, documents to everyone asking, you know, what do you need? What do you have? How are you equipped? Your emergency rooms, your, your uh, um, uh, personal uh, PPEs and so on. Uh, finally, on the 13th, the meeting of Help You Ministers takes place. Uh, the only relevant decision that comes out of that is, okay, let's have a joint purchasing mechanism, which is one of the mechanisms the European Union has to kind of uh, speed up but also bulk uh, bulk buy uh, but at the same time on the same day the ecdc tells that meeting uh, that the problem is not uh, the ability to detect the cases but the lack of resources basic equipment and contact tracing capabilities okay so here we are february 13th we're quite a way down from january 9th and now problems start to emerge. Uh, we then go on um, February 14th, again, the ECDC, who's meeting on a more regular basis, uh, lists uh, a long uh, list of unknown information um, and uh, risks that the virus poses for Europe. Uh, and also states that uh, the state of preparedness of countries is uncertain. And this goes back to what Filippo is saying. When you have a highly fragmented system and when countries don't come back to you with the information, you don't know what's going on on the ground. You may think you're prepared. You may think countries are ready, uh, but you really don't know. And you're kind of like Patrick Lagadec was saying earlier, navigating, assuming things that are probably not true. Um, we then go on February 15, the ECDC is still finalizing guidelines on pandemic measures. We have blamed the Italian government, uh, and we have emphasized this in the book, uh, for not having updated its 2006 pandemic plan. Uh, but it's not that the EU did much better because the EU plan hadn't been updated since 2010. Um, and then uh, last but not least, on February 18th, during one of the meetings, um, Robert Koch, um, Osma Hamouda from the Robert Koch Institute in Germany points out that the PPE market in Europe is completely empty. There, there's no way to buy anything. Okay, so we're, we're February 18. Um, we've gone quite, quite a long way. Let's go to the last slide of the timeline. Um, and despite all of this, despite this warning that we don't have access to uh, PPEs, here we have another plane taking off for China with 25 additional tons of PPEs being shipped. So it is clear that there is a huge disconnect here from the technical level, between the technical level, who's trying to figure out what's going on and, and the risks and what is available, and the political level, who's trying to, I understand, I think, I imagine, play some sort of soft power game with China and shipping uh, PPEs that would be badly needed in the in the following weeks um, off to China. Uh, so then, <laughs> two days later, the EU launches the the procurement scheme so that uh, the countries can pool resources to buy the PPEs. Um, on February 26, the Italian government raises the alarm 
uh, and requests PPEs. It did not reply to the previous request, but now it is actually asking the EU for help. And then, of course, nobody's answering because there are no PPEs uh, in the market. We go on to March 2nd here, Ursula von der Leyen, uh, our president of the EU, uh, changes the, the risk level um, and it, it brings it up to high and it announces the new coronavirus response team, which in fact adds complexity to an already extremely complex uh, set of organizations trying to interact with, with each other. And this, I think, is another interesting subject to, to explore. Um, Panic, uh, of course, starts. We all remember that between the 2nd and the 14th of March. Borders start uh, being closed unilaterally. Uh, the, the free movement in Europe is basically blocked. Uh, medical devices are no longer shipped around. Medicines are blocked. Um, it's, it's kind of an incredible state. Um, and then on March 12th, uh, finally, the EU experts state that the pandemic cannot be stopped. And I just ask you, 54 days uh, have passed um, for the EU to uh, bring the level of risk up to high. Uh, just the last slide, because I think it's relevant to what's going on now. Uh, we then had a number of months, uh, eight, 10, six, we, we can discuss that, to develop a vaccine strategy and plan. And obviously, as it is clear, compared to what is happening in other countries, we failed at that too. So I think we need to ask a lot of questions, basically, <laughs> uh, of, of the EU uh, response and, and what actually happened. And I think I also have to point out, because I think it is fair that we uh, uh, wrote this chapter in the book, also thanks to uh, the work done by the Investigative uh, Journalism Bureau, uh, who ran a very interesting uh, and in-depth story about what was going on in Europe. And we took that, of course, we asked for permission, and we went and read all the minutes of all the meetings and enriched uh, that content and, and uh, created a chapter out of the European response. Brilliant, Patrick. Thanks a million for that. That was a really comprehensive run through of the of the timeline at the EU level. Let's turn our attention to a different organization. Now, we mentioned a little while ago, the World Health Organization. So, Filippo, can you tell us the role that the, the World Health Organization or the WHO have played in this pandemic? Yeah, in pandemic, you, during epidemic, you need a, a, a very strong technical advice, reliable technical advice. So that can already align people, even in, in, if the system and system are different. But uh, somehow WHO has reduced it how authority in this field. I mean, there's been a, already a lot of criticism during uh, the Ebola epidemic uh, that was uh, in which the alarm was delayed and uh, there was an underestimation on the assumption without any evidence that uh, Ebola will not struck uh, urban area. And that was a wrong assumption. So after that, uh, this was 2014, there was the commitment to uh, to reform uh, the WHO, but uh, actually nothing happened. It's uh, still the same. It's an organization which has not changed much in the past 50 years, while all the world is changing. At the same time, uh, even the funding uh, system of WHO is changed and is a little bit less independent than what it was uh, several years before. Um, what happened uh, in, during this pandemic, uh, basically, was the same kind of mistake that we have seen during the Ebola epidemic. There was an underestimation of the, of the severity of the, uh, the, the epidemic. There was uh, a delay in uh, uh, warning and uh, calling the international emergency. But most uh, serious was uh, the lack uh, capacity to collect evidence in the first month in which this uh, epidemic developed in Wuhan. I mean, WHO is suppo supposed to collect evidence, uh, go where the things happen, and uh, uh, advise the other country. Um, there was uh, even wrong information regarding the role of the uh, 
uh, asymptomatic case that it, at the beginning were said that we're not able to transmit the disease, but we saw one of the key points for this epidemic is the presence of asymptomatic that spread without, with difficulty of control. Uh, even on the face mask, the use of PPA at the beginning was said they were not useful. I mean, um, a good criteria is always uh, to be most cautious in this case. Uh, uh, just uh, take all the precaution, even if you are not sure if they are using or not using. That has been confusing and has been uh, uh, creating damage. Um, finally, the, there was a clear indication to check and test. This uh, affects mostly in Italy, where the Minister of Health in January request all the health facility to, to test uh, uh, the pneumonia of viral origin, which uh, was not identified. And uh, soon after, a few days after, WHO said, no, you check only the one which has a clear epidemiological link with Wuhan. So this delay the, the discovery of uh, endogenous transmission of case. This was another important. We also have to understand that WHO is talking for 161 countries, some very poor, some very, very rich, and in some cases, in, in a pandemic, some country has not been affected, are, are fully involved. So it may be also this uh, uh, is one of the problems. The idea to have uh, the, the, the the idea to have one European agency, which technical agency, which you can give advice to the European country, where we will have more or less the same country, may be more effective. Of course, this implies a strong strength in ECDC, both on the surveillance component, the capacity to uh, collect data and produce uh, uh, information, uh, timely information, and also on its capacity to uh, uh, provide advice to the country, to the Minister of Health. So this is uh, basically where we should look forward in the next years. Okay, um, Dermot, I think maybe we should pick up on some of the questions that, uh, that we have from, uh, from the yeah. audience. That is no problem. So a lot, a lot of the questions are to do with the, the vaccine strategy in the EU. So I'm gonna pick one of those out to start. It's from Owen Omari. He asks, the, he, well, he states, the EU focused on correctness in the vaccine rollout over speed, correctness being price, regulations, and vaccine safety at the cost of speed and more days of lockdown. Given that speed is of the essence in a pandemic in terms of lives saved, why did the EU take this approach? Anyone who would like to jump in? Patrick, did I see a hand go up there? Yes, I would like to step back a second. What I heard is just for me normal fiasco. When you are not prepared to deal with unknown situations, crises of the 21st centuries, everything you said is normal. The real, the, the normal reaction is to wait. It is really clear to wait. You can't. Uh, uh, you, you can't stop more uh, and then you have in mind how do I coordinate known responses and in that case you are outside of that and the normal reaction is paralysis you wait no anticipation no questions the key question in that kind of situation is what did we miss where is the angle? Where are the, the real questions? What are the traps? And you must be very active, very proactive in the move and not to have the, the usual way when you are not prepared is you go from one silo to another. One silo is legal. Everything must be absolutely clear with no risk. Then you must have a a finance uh, silo, silo, and then a, a science silo. And when each silo is absolutely okay, then you decide that perhaps you could have another step. And uh, then you discover you have 27 decks. 
with 27 helms. And then you are not prepared. Okay, it doesn't work. I remember I was in Brussels in 2007. And the, the, the question of the day was uh, how to face disaster in Europe. And I tried to, to, to clarify that the problem we had now was not the problem of yesterday. And I, I, the title I chose was Barriers in the Mine, Fiasco on the Ground. But it was not what people were there to, to listen. And the, the focus point was is it possible to have relief columns in Europe? Which for me is very basic. The real problem is how together we can confront impossible problems, unknown challenges. If you don't have that, you have all these uh, strands of impossibilities. And then you wait, you wait, you wait, and you lose every single battle. Because you have to be sure before thinking of a vaccine and then you're surprised and then you don't have the data and you wait for the data and you wait to have the green light and you ask every uh, single state to give another green light and etc etc and you wait you wait and, and you lose the battle the, the to do something else requires that you are very really prepared but we have we have no preparation at the highest level to confront the unknown. We have preparation to coordinate known responses. And this is not the way you can deal with 21st centuries. So what you say, what everything I heard on the fiasco would be exactly the same on any other problem. Uh, safety, uh, health is not the, 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 the real problem here. It could be a blackout, it could be um, a cyber problem. It would be exactly the same things. Because when you are not prepared to confront unknown situations, you do that. So this is just normal fiasco. Just to add, and Filippo, I think I'll let you speak. Yeah, I think you know, to add because uh, um, from a, a medical point of view, I mean, we, we have to be very careful to put uh, uh, speed in front of safety. I mean, because uh, it's not only the the immediate effect that the vaccine may have, but is the damage can do on all immunization uh, credibility. If you have some vaccine which is creating damage, especially in these days, uh, we will have a, a huge amount of people which will refuse vaccine. I just remind you, it was beginning of 900 when uh, the Salk vaccine for polio Give, uh, affect some children which remain paralyzed. That brought to an halt and uh, to the campaign for polio. And it didn't start until the salt vaccine was, uh, the, uh, the salt vaccine was developed. So this is uh, uh, something we have to be very careful. What I think is really the point is we cannot rely on the market force for vaccine. Every country or Europe uh, and behalf of all countries should have the capacity to produce vaccine. I don't think any country in Europe uh, rely on imported we weapon for its army. Everybody produces its own weapon. The same should be for vaccine because it's a matter of security. Yeah, let me jump in. Um, I see Dennis also had a question on on the vaccine um i think the the, the vaccine shows uh, that in a crisis situation you're faced with choices and that's what crisis management is all about it's managing choices um there is no choice that has zero risk all choices you make have some degree of risk and you have to evaluate to the best of your creativity, uh, intellect, uh, what is uh, the best possible road to take. And I think the choice of the question of the vaccine is very interesting because as far as I can tell, I could spot four different strategies on the vaccine. We had the US and the UK, we can call them the venture capitalists. They threw money into the market, they threw money at companies and said, you produce the vaccine. We want to be at the table. We're going to, we want to be the first. 
but here's billions of dollars for you to develop. And the US, for example, took a huge risk, if you think about it, with the, uh, Moderna, uh, which hadn't developed anything until that moment. But obviously, uh, the, the, the people who were making the decision in the US and in the UK uh, felt that there was convincing evidence and the technology was mature enough uh, to ensure that they would be able to produce a vaccine. So we have the venture capitalists, uh, the Anglo-Saxons, who uh, said, let's go into business with the pharmaceutical companies and let's develop the vaccine. Then we have Israel, which took a slightly different approach, said, OK, let me go uh, with the first vaccine available, Pfizer, and let me do a trade off. I will become the guinea pig. I will give you the data from my whole inoculation as long as I am the first uh, that can use the vaccine. And of course, they have uh, very sophisticated logistics. Uh, we know Israel. We know the strength of the Israeli military they were able to roll it out very fast. The Americans on the other side, uh, because they are creative and maybe they're not as uh, uh, bound to, uh, how can I say, uh, formalities as much as we are here in Europe, they vaccinate anywhere. You go to the drugstore and they vaccinate you. You go to a doctor, you go to a center. Um, so they really made sure you could get vaccinated anywhere if you wanted to. Uh, so we had, uh, the Anglo-Saxon approach, the Israeli approach. The Swiss took another interesting approach, which was to say, we're going to go with the new technology because the new technology will ensure that if the new variants of the, vac uh, of the virus, uh, the vaccine manufacturer will be able to adapt the vaccine very quickly. So we want to make sure that we have access to the newest and the best technology and price for us is not an issue. And I think this, is a significant difference with the European approach, uh, which, as Filippo indicated, was basically a market approach. Let's go to the market. Let's negotiate the best price. And I think there's a quote I saw the other day. I think I posted it uh, on, on my, in my article on LinkedIn uh, a few days ago, uh, where the person in charge at the EU level uh, said, well, but, you know, it's taxpayers' money. We have to be concerned about that. Now, that tells you that people, as Patrick was saying, are thinking in silences. How can you put lives, you know, on the same level as taxpayer money? You may not have taxpayers tomorrow. So, you know, that's something to, to consider. Um, so I, I hope I answered some of, uh, of the comments on the, on the vaccine part. Yeah, that's great. We've covered a lot of a lot of the questions we had about the, the vaccine were covered there. The next question I'd like to ask you comes from Tiago Doran. Tiago asks, how would you describe the role of the media and politics in the COVID response? How much have they influenced the course of the crisis? And again, whoever would like to jump in there, feel free. I'll, uh, I'll take it, uh, I'll give it a shot. Um, I think it's very difficult to generalize across countries. Um, I think media uh, um, are different in different countries and, and it, it is very difficult to say, well, um, there was, they played this role, they played that role. I would certainly say that uh, as far as I can tell, uh, and I can only speak of the Italian experience, uh, and we've uh, we've uh, covered this in the book um, has played a tremendous role. Media played a tremendous role. First of all, television, uh, ironically, went back to be the centerpiece of the information infrastructure for people. Locked into the house, the only thing you would do is switch on the TV and be bombarded uh, from uh, six o'clock in the evening when the civil protection agency. Uh, was doing its uh, uh, press conference in the evening to give the numbers of the dead, the hospitalized, um, and so on, all the way to past midnight with the uh, talk shows and so on. So what I think, the, the, what, what media failed to do, and I speak about Italy, but I think it's true also in other countries, it failed at its 
fundamental uh, task. That is to say, to be the connector between the scientific world and the citizen who wants to know what is happening, who wants to have some direction, who wants to have some clarity. They have failed. They have spectacularized this crisis. They have brought in experts, often in contradiction with each other, politicians, often in contradiction with, with each other. And this, I think, has created one, confusion, and second, fear. Uh, I think the, we're going to see the outcome of this uh, over time. I think the mental health consequences of this uh, crisis will, uh, uh, will, be, will be felt. Uh, from a political point of view, um, again, I don't have a visibility for Europe. Um, I think Patrick, Patrick can probably speak uh, for, for France uh, and, and maybe for other countries if he has a sense. Uh, I say that uh, basically what we've seen in Italy is uh, the complete uh, lack of uh, assumption of responsibility. Uh, we have uh, seen uh, politicians uh, in government uh, basically telling citizens that they were responsible. Uh, we have not seen uh, effective uh, crisis management. We have not seen uh, efficiency. We have not seen transparency. Um, and uh, so I think the, the scorecard for both media and politicians is, is quite uh, low as far as I'm concerned, at least for Italy, uh, in managing uh, the pandemic up to date. Up to date. Uh, we're uh, almost a year and a half into it. Patrick, I don't know what your views are. Again, I would say that if you are not prepared, uh, you have a mountain of impossibilities, contradictions, confusion, etc. Uh, the image I would, I would use is that uh, we have many swimmers um, used to swim in a swimming pool and suddenly you ask them to dive uh, near the Cap Horn uh, during a storm and beat uh, media, politicians, government, opposition, uh, opposition leaders, uh, they are completely lost. So one day they ask something, the other day they ask exactly the contrary or they ask you to, do, to, to, to say something just to be able to say the opposite, but you feel that there is no culture to capture this kind of uh, threats we have in the 21st centuries. When you do not have that, you can have everything at the same time and it is a big mess. And finally, people are paralyzed, very sad and a kind of disgust generally and you lose your cap your collective dynamics and i think it's very dangerous and we are not we are now in this kind of situation if you don't have a capacity to step back to ask new questions and to clarify that you are in in a capacity to to lead in this very difficult situation then you trigger immediate a uh, very difficult situation with a um, mess everywhere and people lose their balance and we are in the middle of that uh, so the, the key point for me is that in the leading system do you have this step back capacity to generate a strategy and not one one day after the other and try to adapt so people are not bad, but just, just not prepared to do that. This is they have to speak another language, and this is not done. So if you don't, if you if we don't do that rapidly, we are going to lose every battle because uh, it's like Sun Tzu said: you, the crisis attack your vision, your strategy, your capacity to to go together. And this uh, this is the danger for our bedrocks, and um, we have to to side the day very rapidly now because it's dangerous. Yeah, I think this this I think that the issue of leadership, of course, is is a crucial one in uh, at times of crisis. Um, so we have not touched on that, uh, but I think there's been generally a lack of humility. Uh, towards the unknown, uh, 
you know, there has been an eagerness to provide answers when there were no answers available. Um, and I think that's certainly one element that has come across uh, in most countries. Uh, we have to remember that humility is a key uh, trait of leadership in, uh, in crisis situations. Um, and as Patrick says, I'm, I'm a big fan of, of Patrick and his work. Um, what is really lacking, and it's kind of surprising, is this ability to step back and to try to have a longer term perspective. And I think this leads also into the question that uh, Mirado uh, has asked us, uh, which is uh, uh, which is the next COVID-19 issue Europe is going to miss or is not preparing for. And I think that is the kind of question that we should be asking ourselves. That's exactly it. It's step back and say, OK, let's try to you know refocus. Let's try to, uh, you know, uh, look on the longer term, you know, what, what are the threats? Because I had an interesting talk today with Luca Tenzi, who's also listening to us uh, this evening in my office. Um, and, and we talked about, uh, you know, we talked about systemic crisis. And I, I, he mentioned to me, well, you know, this is the first real systemic crisis that we're living through. And I said, I tend to disagree with you. I don't know what Patrick thinks, but I, I tell you what I told Luca. I said, look, I think this is the fourth systemic crisis that we're going through. The first one was 9-11. That was the first crisis of the 21st century. We then had the financial meltdown of 2007-2008. We then had in Europe the migration crisis. But what, mind you, the migration crisis is not only a European problem. It's been a big problem in the United States on the southern border as well. Um, and now we're facing the COVID. So this is actually the fourth systemic crisis in the 21st century. If you imagine that we've only been in this century for 20 years, we already had four. That should, you know, should should really kind of make us think uh, twice. So uh, certainly one of the problems we're facing now is this inability to step back and to try to uh, look look forward. And as Patrick says. Um, I, and I, I believe this, uh, it, uh, it's, it's rocking the very foundations uh, of, of our country. It's, it, I think the most dangerous aspect of this uh, COVID, or certainly one of the most dangerous aspects, is that it's uh, weakening the trust between citizens and institutions. And I think that is a very, very dangerous, um, very dangerous threat uh, that uh, that we're facing, because when we lose trust, uh, that's the very fabric of society that starts to uh, break down. Perfect. Thanks a million for that, Patrick. Um, so you've mentioned there the the lack of leadership, maybe that they need a, to rethink the strategy at the European level. Patrick Lagadec, do you think we need to rethink crisis management altogether at the European level? Or are there some elements that are working, others that aren't? What, what do you, how do you feel about this? In my practice, not with the Europe, uh, European level, but in my practice, you have a whole range of things to do to, to be able to deal with this crisis. But I would underline at least two points. The first, at every level, on, in any silos, leaders have to be trained uh, in another way completely. When you have simulations, when they exist, you train people to coordinate rapidly known responses. Now we have to prepare people to be totally surprised. So you, you should work on blank pages when there is no expertise that you can have to, to, to respond rapidly. And if leaders have not been prepared to confront the unknown, to be surprised, so the, your answers are not there to avoid to be surprised. You prepare people to be surprised. And second, to be rapidly creative in a situation you don't know with people you don't know. So this is a basis. If you don't have these leaders prepared to do that, you are finished because they will wait, wait, wait. 
The second point, uh, and I discussed a lot with Patrick on that, to be able to step back, you must train and prepare some very tiny net cells uh, to be, as I, I call that, rapid reflection force. A, a, a group of people trained to do that, to clarify the situation. Can I qualify what is it about? What is the essence of the crisis? Because generally you go rapidly, but in the wrong direction. This is not a problem because WHO didn't say it was a problem, so let's wait. The second is to clarify the traps. What are the big quagmires that you have in front of you? Because generally you go, will go directly to wrong answers. And when you are prisoners of that, it's very late, difficult to do something. Uh, third question, what, who are the actors, the stakeholders, and what I'm going to, to do with uh, them? And the fourth question is most important. Can you imagine a combination of impulse, impulses that you could have to shape new futures and to, to be able to do something immediately? If you have nobody able to, to, to take all the answer, all the dimensions of, of the problems, financial, uh, legal, scientific, if you don't have that, to help decision makers to clarify something like a strategy, <coughs> I think you, 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 you cannot uh, dance with the crisis. So it would be that my two advice <coughs> to go rapidly at the European level. <coughs> Perfect. So, Filippo, you want to, to add yeah. something to that? I wanted to add a, yeah. a comment. Yeah, um, I think from an health point of view, <laughs> we need two things. One is coordination and the other is timely decision. I mean, uh, um, of course, uh, uh, it's always an, uh, an expected situation because uh, things are always different. Uh, but uh, with the coordinated approach, you can have a, a much stronger impact. It's surprising that in Europe, in Europe we have a plan, a coordinated plan, to face uh, uh, an energy breakdown, to face a food shortage, to face even bank crisis, which is the best and more coordinated system. But we don't have any plan, to co coordinated plan, to, uh, uh, to face an health emergency. So, uh, the country should prepare their own plan and should be a role of the European Union to coordinate and put together this plan. This will facilitate uh, for sure the answer. And then we have this uh, uh, institution, we have the Health Security Council which meet but doesn't decide, and the, the Council of Health Ministers which decide but seldom meet, because of course these are health ministers. So it should be found uh, a synthesis, uh, a, or giving a more a stronger mandate, uh, mandate to the Health Security uh, council, council, which can provide recommendation and uh, uh, provide guidance. Finally, the role of the CDC. We need technical body which guide the political the political level. Technical body which are focused on the situation, which doesn't make general statement, but say, look, if you act like this, is the way to act according to the evidence we have collected. And this, uh, I think, for the CDC is still a newer organization, but it can, it need to be strengthened and develop uh, to to become a real tool to govern this kind of emergency. Patrick, you wanted to say something? Just to say that okay, coordination is key, but again, if I take my image of swimmers in swimming pool, and you take them to the Cape Horn to dive, how you coordinate people who are not prepared to, 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 to envision this kind of threats. You, you cannot coordinate because they will say nothing. So the, the idea is to prepare people to, to be able to confront that kind of level of difficulty and then you can coordinate them. But at this point, it will be very difficult. Imagine. We had a flood in Paris in 
2016. But the first reaction was, uh, it, we are in June, so there is no flood, because flood are supposed to be in the winter. Second, uh, the flood is not coming by the tributaries and the Seine River, which is uh, the norm. So let's wait. And the third was, uh, there is a Zouave uh, a figure near the Pont L'Alma. And there was no problem. So, but they, they just forgot that between 1910, the, the, the last big flood we had in Paris, and now this figure was uh, just uh, completely in a different high. Uh, so everything was mixed, and people were not prepared to say, stop, we are not playing the game you think. This is something else. So let's coordinate, but on the right data, on the right vision. And for the moment, the vision is blind instantly when the situation is, is not the, the normal one. And this is, I think, and it would be the same, I think, for a bank problem, for a blackout. As soon as it goes outside the normal things, it would be the same reaction. So we have to work on that. If we don't, we will fail on every button. Yeah, let me let me uh, touch on two points uh, that you both raised. I think uh, Filippo clearly indicated uh, the silences that uh, Patrick was talking about earlier. At the European level, we have a crisis management system. There's actually three different crisis management systems, and they mostly apply to banking, food, um, and uh, energy. Now. COVID kind of fell into a black hole, but COVID is not the only thing that can fall in no man's land. There's plenty of other types of crises uh, that may develop that are not banking related, they're not uh, food related, uh, and they're not related to um, uh, the third one I already forgot. Uh, but anyway, th that don't fall. And so what do you do? How do you manage them? You know, so that's one, one point. Uh, and the other point, brings me back to, to what Patrick is saying, is the issue of complexity. We need to approach this with the mind frame of dealing with complexity and not dealing with linear, uh, linear thinking. Uh, I always say when I train, um, I always say, I, I make this analogy. You have to imagine that you are a chess player and that you're playing multiple games on different floors of many different buildings, all at the same time. That is what complexity is about. And that is what crisis management of the 21st century is all about, is managing that level of complexity. So we really need to change the mindset that we have um, and to, to start looking at this very seriously because these are uh, threatening crises. These crises threaten the fabrics of our society. If you think all of these four systemic crises, 9-11, uh, the financial crisis, the immigration crisis, and COVID, they're all crises that deeply have affected and affect the, the, um, the fabric of our societies, of, of our Western societies. And as I was chatting with Luca earlier today, uh, you know, we said it would be very interesting, for example, to, to look at these crises and say, well, five years down the road from those crises, what were the ruptures? What were, what were the things, what, what were the paradigm shifts that we actually saw? Because maybe there's something to learn there. Um, so that's, that's uh, an idea that came up just, uh, just chatting today. But, but that is the reality of the seriousness of the threat that we're facing. And as I said earlier, these crises, they're coming in more and more frequently. Okay, we've got a couple of more questions from the audience. So I'm going to lay those out to you now. The first one comes from Catherine Rogers. Catherine states, trust is key. Do we know anything about the relationship between trust in institutions and willingness to be vaccinated? Who would like to jump in there? Yeah, as much as I know, there is no specific study on this. Uh, 
And uh, I think the trust on vaccination is something more personal. Uh, Sometimes uh, there is a, a very um, developed country which has uh, a good government and trust in government, in which we have strong group against vaccination. I, I, I think, for my impression, we, I don't think there are any study on this, but from my impression, it's a more personal, uh, a personal trust, a personal feeling. It doesn't reflect uh, an uh, acceptance of uh, the, the people who rule us or the, the decide and deliver the vaccination. Um, I think the trust issue, and somebody else mentioned it in, in the chat, uh, is, is key. And uh, I, I said earlier that uh, what we are, we're potentially facing is this uh, collapse in trust that we have in our institutions. I would like to ask uh, Ruben, who's, who's working with us, to maybe just show uh, slide number six, um, because there's some interesting data that was uh, just published by Ipsos. Um, and uh, that shows how the confidence in government uh, to deal with the pandemic, uh, how it changed uh, from uh, February 2020 to uh, basically February 2021. So you see we have in certain countries a very, very significant drop of confidence, which also means, uh, of course, a drop in trust. And I think the next one, uh, number seven, is also interesting uh, because it shows uh, that uh, in, in these countries, the majority believes that the global health authorities uh, will have to answer, will have to provide answers uh, because of this pandemic. So already we're beginning to question, as Filippo said, the WHO uh, and, and other organizations. So our trust um, is, is really uh, being, being uh, shocked, uh, shocked in its, uh, in its foundations. Um, let me see if there's something else that may be worth sharing in terms of, of trust. Uh, well, yes, I think slide 11, if we want to show that, that's again uh, Eurobarometer Special Edition, which was just uh, published. Uh, following the pandemic, uh, almost half of Europeans hold a positive image of the EU. But if you go to the next one, In the last six months, 40% of Europeans have changed their perception. And that perception has gone more towards the negative than the positive. So you see here uh, the trend that uh, we're, beginning, we're beginning to see. Um, and the other interesting one, and then I'll, I'll stop showing the slides, but again, it's just to make you think how these things affect us, uh, is, is slide 13. Uh, where the, the coronavirus crisis has brought people to reflect on the future of Europe. So you see how dangerous uh, this, uh, this crisis uh, really is. It goes far beyond uh, what, what we've been uh, imagining. It's going far beyond the health dimension. It's going far beyond the economic dimension. It's going far beyond the uh, mental health dimension, it's going uh, far beyond the social dimension. Uh, the, the effects, the underground effects uh, are beginning to show and uh, it would be in our best interest, I think, uh, to try to stop them uh, as soon as possible. Just before we move on to the next question, we have a follow-up question from Catherine Rogers. She says, is this drop in confidence unusual in a crisis? Wouldn't we expect to see a bit of a rally around the flag effect, such as that which followed 9-11, for example? Yeah, for, for sure. That is what we would expect. And that is what happened in the first phase uh, of the pandemic crisis. Uh, people, I think most uh, surveys, France was the only exception. There was never any great trust in the French government. Uh, but in most countries, uh, there was support for the politicians, for the government, in Italy in particular, although Italy was probably the country uh, that failed uh, to manage the first, second and third wave of the pandemics. Uh, Italy is the country that has the third highest 
death rate in the world per 100,000 uh, inhabitants. Uh, so uh, for sure, uh, there, has, there was that effect in the beginning, but as the governments uh, and, and as those in charge have not been able to charter a course for people to see, perhaps even, um, how can I say, creating false illusions. You know, let's remember the summer, everybody was going out to the beach, no masks, you know, everything, and then boom, it hit us again. Um, so nobody in March said, let's be careful, uh, you know, variants. Who had thought of variants? Did we speak about variants until uh, a few months ago? Uh, no, we did not. Uh, but somebody should have warned us. Somebody, you know, should have clearly stated these are the things that may happen and we need to be prepared for that. But of course, everybody was following the train. Nobody was in anticipation. Everybody was running after the train. And I, I also say, you know, the analogy is if, if you're trying to jump on a train, on, on a magnetic uh, levitation train that is running at 400 kilometers per hour, and you try to figure out, you know, how you pilot the train uh, and try to figure out how at the next station you're able to go off track. Well, it's a mission impossible. Absolutely. So just on the topic of variants there, I'd like to turn our attention to another question which came in from Tiago Doran, and it relates to Brazil. So Brazil is the highest COVID threat for the world right now. How do you think the EU must deal with this situation, considering the business affairs and the possibility of letting the country collapse commercially? Again, whoever I wants to get in, Patrick? Yeah, I, don't, I, I certainly don't feel I have the competence uh, to, to, to address the question. Um, but I think the, the question points, again, to the systemic nature of the crisis. Uh, you know, we're talking about an important country in Latin America. Um, and can, can anybody afford for that country to become completely unstable or to collapse uh, or, or, uh, or not to be able to, uh, uh, to be sustainable in the long term? Um, I think these, again, are, are the questions that need to be asked. Uh, unfortunately, I am not uh, the expert to answer them. Uh, but, but certainly, they are the questions to be asked. Patrick, I don't know if you have a view, or Filippo, if you have a view. Yes, perhaps I would say that um, the three things to to show is that kind of um, impossible situation is first to show your ability to step back and not just run, 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 run. Uh, let me speak, let me speak, words, words, words. No, step back. Second, the ability to cl clarify questions and not only answers, because we don't have the answers. So the people who are able to clarify questions, intelligent questions, the way to clarify those questions, I think will be very, <laughs> very important for trust. And then to think, as I said, a combination of initiatives, uh, clarifying that you will make some errors but you will correct that rapidly. During the, the Sunday hurricanes, the man just near the, 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 the chief of the FEMA in the US created three uh, little groups. When the first one was to detect the errors, the mistakes, to correct that rapidly. The second, to detect the emerging uh, dynamics to be able, able to, to, to work and dance with all these dynamics. And the third was very good, was uh, invention capacity. Give me com new ideas, new combination of ideas. And <coughs> this is a kind of dynamics we, we must be in. So the, 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 the key thing is, do these people see me able to take some stepping back ability do they see me able to, to 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 clarify questions and then to suggest a very subtle and uh, combination of ideas uh, and then 
you are qualified to dance. If you don't do that, you lose your trust very rapidly because you, 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 you say you claim you have the answer, big answers, and day after day, your miracle it, it doesn't work. So you have to show you are at the same level at the crisis, and this is a, the key message. It is not words; it's just the dynamic and the, the impulse you give in the situation. But for that, you must be prepared, because if you are not, you are terrified by this, because you say, I, I must have an answer, but you don't. May I clarify a small point? Because, uh, of course, I talk by a net perspective, and uh, um, well, Patrick and Patrick, they talk about crisis management. Crisis management is very new discipline, actually. And uh, while well, medicine is an old discipline, and from 1800, we know how to deal with the emergency. So uh, some of my answers are not, uh, um, are, are based on the past experience. Uh, because of course, if you talk, uh, looking at the sector, uh, we have some answer. I mean, uh, to be ready, you can stock the PPPA, you can uh, reinforce surveillance, you can improve quarantine. And uh, Brazil is not the only country which represents a threat, because any country, uh, the, the, this uh, pandemic go in different phase, and, and we may have different countries which are more affected. So the issue of travel, which is really the new things in infectious disease, you know, uh, fast traveling from one part of the world to the other should be considered carefully how to uh, avoid uh, the, the transmission from one country to the uh, another without limiting uh, uh, the, the freedom of the people to move uh, through check, through the through test, uh, through sterilizing system in the airplane. We should think also about this. And, so basically, uh, this is uh, what come out. Uh, we can we are able to handle a health emergency, but we should not always not forget that now things are more complex than before. When when you deal on health, you have your health sector and you deal with it. Now you have to. Uh, uh, to uh, take decision which affect also commercial sector well political level and other things so uh, it's always a health focus approach but uh, it's important to include all other aspects in your response that's perfect so i'll go on to the next audience question then it comes from caden stinson now caden writes Thanks for an interesting discussion. So far, there's been a lot of retrospective analysis and alluding to how unprepared the EU was. Could the speakers discuss some concrete changes they would like to see to the EU system, which, would, which they would like to see implemented, and explain how they predict this would have changed the current situation had they have been deployed before the crisis? So we can take this from every aspect. Filippo from the health perspective, Patrick from the crisis management perspective. Who would like to start? Well, let maybe Filippo start uh, with sure, uh, with help, sure. and then we can. Okay, I think we touch. I'll be brief because we touch already this uh, uh, this point. Uh, two point, two important issue. One is coordination. The other is timely information. For coordination, you need to strengthen the the uh, organism of coordination, the health sector, the, the health security committee, and uh, the uh, council of health minister. Try to find uh, a way to make them more uh, uh, effective in providing uh, guidance and more timely. You know. On the timely issue, we have the uh, importance of surveillance to improve the surveillance system, early warning system, which may be a, a good point brought forward by ACDC if uh, its role uh, is, uh, will be structured and improved. Finally, I think there is need uh, with the uh, to, to prepare this uh, pandemic plan uh, under the coordination of the EU. Otherwise, we'll have a country which will not do, country will do, country will do better, country will do. So under the EU coordination, every, each country should have uh, a plan. Uh, 
basic plan, uh, stock the PPA and uh, uh, strengthen your surveillance uh, and uh, check your uh, dead, uh, if there is, uh, the dead rate, if there is improving rates and things like that. But this uh, plan should be uh, at the same time uh, complementary and coordinated among all the other countries. I think the discussion is already undergoing. I read many things, uh, many papers on uh, the European crisis management uh, uh, people, and I think this is already what are going to be proposed uh, in, in in the future. So on the health side, we can be sure things will improve. I think. Perfect. Patrick, would you like to jump in from the crisis management point of view? I'll, I'll let Patrick speak first, and then the other Patrick will speak. Perhaps just a point. If we have had a rapid reflection force trained to confront impossible crises, I think they could have um, given some signals very rapidly. First, uh, they could have uh, looked, uh, so immediately there was some delay at the beginning. And in a crisis, when you have this delay, you are sure there will be some problems. So you could instantly send a warning, attention, we are behind the crisis, we are not in the rhythm of the crisis, we are going to lose the battle, do something. Uh, and you can apply that all the way for the vaccines, for example. Uh, they could have asked, what are the hidden problems? Uh, are we going with the right things the way we deal uh, in the legal approach? Uh, as Patrick said, uh, is the financial approach the right one, the right one for that kind of problem? And then, do we have to have one month to, to be one month behind the US when we authorize any single vaccine? Uh, what I heard was uh, we, some weeks after is not a problem. Yes, but it was some thousands of people uh, kill, uh, died every day. So this rap rapid reflection force could have launched key questions and push people in charge to see uh, hidden problems and to, to see, to, to, to understand the necessity to go rapidly, to, to adapt an, another rhythm. If we don't have that, we just follow and follow and follow and suddenly it's a Niagara Fall. So this is, this would be my first recommendation, having this kind of group able to send warning signals very rapidly. Yeah, I would uh, I would add to what uh, to what uh, Patrick said that I think there is uh, two fundamental problems which are not the only problems of the European Union. Let it be clear, the problem of all or most Western countries because we all failed the response. Let's be honest. I mean, nobody's done well uh, compared, for example, to the Asian countries. So there must be something that is fundamentally flawed in the way we approach uh, the problem. Uh, I say there's there's uh, two basic elements. First, there's an architecture element. The architecture is too complex. Um, it's too bureaucratic, it's too complex. There's probably the wrong people in the wrong places. Uh, and that uh, leads to delays, leads to the inability to see and to foresee and to be creative. Uh, so I would say that is the first problem. It's an architectural problem. The system is architecturally flawed. The second problem is the problem of preparation that Patrick was leading to. Uh, I think we're not investing enough in preparation. I was very surprised to read, I live in Switzerland, to read a report uh, that uh, criticized uh, very strongly the uh, civil servants in Switzerland uh, for uh, not being uh, able to uh, manage properly the crisis here. Uh, and I think that's a problem with our civil servants. There are people who are just sitting in their chairs. Uh, they're probably not stimulated in any way. They're probably at the end of their careers. 
if they're young, they're inexperienced. There's no training system. There is no preparation. And again and again, we heard this evening the importance of being prepared, the importance of being prepared. You know, an airplane pilot flies you across the ocean um, after hours of simulations, after, you know, hours and hours in different kinds of aircrafts. That's called training. That's called preparedness. And we're lacking all of that. Going back to the rapid reflection force that uh, uh, Patrick was talking about, this is not uh, some sort of intellectual exercise or, or idea. Uh, the Danish uh, Civil Protection Agency has created a rapid reflection force. And that's to deal with emergencies, not crisis. But the government of Singapore has created within the prime minister's office a rapid reflection force. And you can actually go on the government of Singapore website and you will find it and it will tell you what its tasks are and, and what it does. So we also need to step down from our pedestal of thinking that we know best and that we are the best in class and have a little bit of humility, look around, see what other people are doing, learn from other people's experiences and rethink our systems. If I may, just a point on the, um, the airline and the aircraft and the pilots. We had a, a seminar, a, a big conference, international conference, uh, two decades ago in Paris. And the title was Surprise in the Cockpit. It, it was very strange because uh, in the cockpit you have all the checklists. And the consensus was we trained these pilots to normal situations, uh, a little abnormal, and simulation, simulators are used to, to give them the possibility to answer rapidly according to the book. And the conclusion of the, of the conference was that we have to train them to unforeseen situations. And the pilots in the room said, yes, this are the key problems we have and in long flights we have some things like that and i think even in the pilots in the in pilot activity it was important so imagine when you are a leader in 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 uh, uh, in the government or in any big agency you have to be trained not only to to apply the textbook but to be ready to something completely outside of your scope of your vision. I remember a conference we had in Rome uh, around 2000 about near Earth objects, and they gave us a very strange scenario with the announcement that you will have a very serious problem probably within six months. And you have perhaps to consider to evacuate three countries but we don't know which one exactly but if we wait it will be too la too late you imagine poor people confronted with that if you are not prepared to to to, to dance with this kind of things immediately you lose all your capacities all your intelligence and you say uh, and uh, your tendency to say this is outside of responsibility outside of intelligence but now we have uh, these kind of blank pages every day and we have to, f to find a way to do that. It's very far from our Cartesian approach when you have clear-cut answers. We have to go from that to the idea our responsibility and intelligence now should apply to universe, territories, uncharted territories. And we, you have to apply your intelligence to re-pattern um, these uh, territories. This is difficult for us because it's really cultural. But we, if we don't do that, I think after Barbara Tuckman, the historian, she, she worked on the, 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 the Black Death in the 14th century. And is, her conclusion was that uh, at that time, the, the, the society was uh, 
uh, the, 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 yes, the, the network of the society was a church. And at the end, the church was questioned. Why? And for us, it means that science, uh, institutions, uh, health, all of that could be criticized at the end uh, of the crisis. So we have to invent some new way to deal with this uh, very strange crisis we have now. Okay, perfect. I think we're going to have to leave it there because we've got a few, we have a few more questions that have come in from the audience. So I'm sorry we didn't get to them. We will address those questions in the comments, whether they've come in on Facebook or LinkedIn. That was an absolute pleasure. I'd like to offer a massive, massive thank you to Patrick Trancu, Patrick Lagadec, and Filippo Cortale. You've done a brilliant job in explaining some extremely complex issues very concisely, very clearly. So really an honest thank you to the three of you. Um, if you've enjoyed the conversation and if you can read Italian or you know someone who can, I would urge you all to go out and grab a copy of Lo Stato in Crisi to find out more about the ongoing, the ongoing pandemic. And finally, don't forget to follow Arbury Road for all the latest in-depth insight into the most important stories across Europe and beyond. You can find us at arburyroad.com on all the regular social networks and on all the podcast platforms. That's all for me. Thanks again for joining us tonight. It was an absolute pleasure. Have a lovely night, everyone.